This is Europe. These are the German speaking bits of Europe, namely Germany, Austria, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, chunks of Switzerland, bits of Belgium, bits of Italy, and also Mallorca if you include the German tourists. In short, Germany is the dominant German dude, Switzerland is the German banker who is roommates with different people, Liechtenstein is the German banker's banker, Luxembourg is that German dude who would rather speak French. Eastern Belgium is that tiny German dude who lives with a bunch of French and Dutch dudes that hate each other. South Tyrol is that German dude who got stuck with a bunch of Italian dudes. Austria is like that laid-back little brother of Germany, who created World War I and World War II for Germany to deal with. Historically speaking, Austria and Germany are quite similar to each other such that there were calls for unification between these two German countries, some attempts were more successful than the other. From Austria's point of view, Austria is definitely different from Germany, and everyone should never confuse Austrians with people from Germany. But for the rest of the world, Austria is often mistaken as Australia, and reckon Austria is like an expansion pack of Germany. So, who is Austria and what makes it distinct from Germany? Well, their story kinda began when the Charlemagne Empire was split into three bits. This bit here eventually became France, this bit here became a buffer zone and got eaten alive, this bit here formed the basis of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, it was more like a confederation of semi-independent, mostly German-speaking cities, duchies, or whatever they called themselves. Throughout the Middle Ages, as the Germans moved eastwards, these bits here formed the nucleus of the Eastern Realm, the German name for Austria. The Austrian lands later came under the control of the Habsburgs, a bunch of kings who would then become largely synonymous with Austria itself. During those days, a king can get more lands by marriage and inheritance. The Habsburg royal family was the expert in marrying their way up, doing sweet home Alabama stuff, and eventually became the dominant dudes within the Holy Roman Empire. The Austrians managed to halt the Ottoman Turks' expansion into Central Europe, providing protection and suzerainty for different ethnic groups in the Austrian-Ottoman buffer zone. The Austrian Empire thus became one of the great powers of Europe, whilst the rest of the German states within the Holy Roman Empire remained small and squabbled amongst themselves. Everything changed with the rise of Prussia. Who is this Prussia? In short, Prussia was a German state descended from a bunch of German crusaders in the Baltics, who gradually got stronger when these four Fredericks came along, beating up a lot of other countries. Prussia's great power status was cemented when it won the Seven Years' War, which made it a big boss within the Holy Roman Empire, alongside Austria. Although Prussia and Austria were both German, they have different mindsets. Prussia was militaristic whilst Austria was aristocratic. Prussia was homogenous whilst the Austrian Empire was multicultural. Prussia loved Protestant Jesus whilst Austria preferred the Catholic version. But both Prussia and Austria got beaten up by France during the Napoleonic Wars. After Napoleon's defeat, his nationalistic ideals remained in Europe and blossomed in German-speaking lands. There were calls for German unification. But how? Do they want Prussian domination, Austrian domination, or both? Well, Otto von Bismarck, the minister-president of Prussia, preferred Prussian domination in a unified Germany, obviously. Prussia finessed its way to German unification by beating up Denmark, Austria, and France, eventually forming the German Empire. This German Empire excluded Austria. Part of the reason why Austria was reluctant to form a united Germany with Prussia was because the Austrian Empire also included homelands of other ethnicities. Separating the German-speaking lands in the empire to join the pan-German nation dominated by Prussia would not be a wise move. The Austrian Empire became the Austro-Hungarian Empire after being beaten up by Prussia, basically meant that the Hungarians are now a big deal within the already fractured empire. As you can imagine, this only fueled more inter-ethnic beefs within the empire, as every ethnic group do not want to be bossed around. The German Empire grew stronger day by day, whilst the Austro-Hungarian Empire spiraled down. 
By the early 20th century, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was more or less a puppet of the German Empire. Partly due to the inter-ethnic tensions within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the rise of South Slavic nationalism, this Austrian Archduke was assassinated. The Austro-Hungarian Empire thought it can bully Serbia into submission, but Serbia had Mother Russia on its side. One thing led to the other, and a small Balkan beef became a worldwide conflict. After World War I, everyone blamed the German Empire for the whole thing, although it was Austria who kinda started it. The Austro-Hungarian Empire disintegrated based on ethnic lines. It is noted that at that time, the German people in Austria do not feel Austrian at all, as they generally had German national consciousness. In other words, Austria did not have a distinct national identity after World War I. During the interwar period, the people in Germany and Austria did not really have a good time, especially when being a millionaire meant nothing. Many German people thus turned to fascism as their ticket out of misery. A random painter from Austria migrated to Germany, and made Germany great again. He even Anschluss Austria into Germany, because German people together strong. Now this is where the Austrian identity crisis began. Was Austria the first victim of Nazi Germany? Or was Austria happily being Anschluss and effectively being a part of Nazi Germany who beat up other countries during World War II? The Allies could not care much about what Austrians think, and occupied Austria just like what they did with Germany. Austria was thus split into four zones of occupation, with the capital Vienna being split into four zones. With the onset of Cold War, it seems like Austria would walk the same path as Germany. However, in the 1950s, the occupiers suddenly decided to allow Austria to be reunited again. Why? From Soviet's point of view, having a perpetually neutral neighbor is better than having a volatile puppet state. From Americans' point of view, a neutral Austria would be one less thing to piss off the Soviets, eliminating a potential spark-off point in the Cold War. It is noted that the Austrian politicians from both zones of influence were more or less in favor of a united Austria, and were pushing hard for it. Austria was thus reunited and was given independence on one condition, never to unite with Germany, because a big unified Greater Germany is intimidating indeed. Whilst West and East Germany joined NATO and the Warsaw Pact respectively, Austria remained neutral, forming a distinct Austrian neutrality foreign policy, which defined its national identity until today, for now at least. Today, Austria is one of the most developed countries in the world, and famous for having a bunch of people singing around the Alps. Although Austria has existed one way or the other for centuries, the national identity of Austria, particularly the ethnic German-speaking people in Austria as a distinct nation-state is a relatively new concept. The difference between Austria and Germany is much like the difference between Irish and English people. Although both Austrians and Germans technically speak German, they have completely different dialects. The Germans would like to understand the Austrians, but they could not. The Austrians understand the Germans, but they do not want to. In Germany, if you speak with a regional dialect, the Germans will think you are dumb. In Austria, it is quite normal to have a regional dialect, and if you speak standard German, the Austrians will think you are pretentious. Austrians reckon the Germans, particularly the Northern Germans as too straightforward and have no sense of humor, whilst the Germans reckon the Austrians are slimy and joke around too much. Dark and sarcastic humor is not for everyone. Austrians are very polite but they do not mean it, whilst the Germans are straightforward and they mean what they say. The Austrian working culture can be seen as more relaxed, whilst the German workers generally love hierarchy and being tough on one another. Austrians are seen as laid back and enjoying life more, whilst the Germans love punctuality and efficiency more than anything else. This is basically a modern manifestation of the Prussians and Habsburgs. For Germans, a situation may be serious but never hopeless. For Austrians, a situation may be hopeless but never serious. Germans love obeying the rules, whilst Austrians think the rules are more of a recommendation. Austria generally loves the past, whilst Germany tends to be more progressive. 
One of Austria's greatest achievements is being able to convince the world that Hitler was a German and Beethoven was an Austrian. Looking at a regional level, Bavaria is the closest thing to a twin brother that Austria has. Both Bavaria and Austria are overwhelmingly Catholic, as opposed to the Protestant Northern Germany. An Austrian can order a Semmel in Bavaria without a problem, whilst the Northern Germans will probably have no idea what the Austrian dude is ordering. Bavarians think their beer drinks are the best, better than those Austrians who drink too much wine instead of beer. For the Swiss Germans, they are jealous that the Austrians are better in skiing, and reckon that they both have a common enemy in the big bossy Germany. Austrians on the other hand, reckon Switzerland is doing way better in economy, having their very own Swiss banking industry, whilst the Austrian economy is dominated by Germany. Both Switzerland and Austria are going after Germany's tourism money like nobody's business, because getting rich is their favorite pastime. Nowadays, the Nazi past of Austria is being confronted, as playing the victim card continuously is not working. The international community do not really buy into Austria's first victim mentality anymore. This seemingly hypocritical facade of Austrian innocence has challenged Austria's very own national identity since its existence as an independent country. Partly due to decades of neutrality identity enforcement, there is currently no appetite among the Austrian leaders or the people to push for unification with Germany. The Austrians are now very satisfied being its own nation-state, except maybe looking to Anschluss South Tyrol from Italy, who knows. The lesson from Austria's existence is that, if you do not have a tangible distinct national identity, you can actually create one. Good luck maintaining it. Thanks for watching.